Well, we're going to undertake part two of our series, and I'll just call this one Nimrod the Second, the Eleventh King, taking it from Micah 5 5, when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, there are many titles of this person that we tend to call the Antichrist. In the uh, New Testament, he's the angel of the bottomless pit, or at least that's an allusion to him. We tend to call him the Antichrist. That Greek term actually means the pseudo-Christ, or instead of Christ. Uh, our term tends to imply he's against Christ, and he certainly is. But the term actually implies being a substitute for Christ. Uh, he's called the beast, of course, in Revelation 11, the false prophet in Revelation 13, the father of the lie, lawless one, man of sin. There's many of these titles. Uh, son of perdition, man of sin, are the ones I've mentioned are the most common ones. In the Old Testament, there are 33 allusions, as listed by Arthur W. Pink, as an example. And I won't go through all of these in the interest of time, but there are a few that you should be sensitive to. We're, we're noticing that the word Assyrian seems to be used by Isaiah and Micah and Ezekiel and elsewhere uh, as an idiom of this coming final world leader. Zechariah calls him the idol shepherd, I-D-O-L, not idol like lazy, but idol like false worship. The idol shepherd. In fact, it's the only physical description we have of him in the Bible, to my knowledge, is in the last few verses of Zechariah 11. We saw him called the little horn in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. In Daniel 9.26, he's called the prince that shall come. We explored that. You could even argue that in Genesis 3.15, he's the seed of the serpent. We all know about the seed of the woman. The seed of the serpent is the, is the contrary seed. And he's called the willful king in Daniel 11 and many other labels. But um, let's take a look at some allusions that we find through the Old Testament. I've just done a sampling here. In Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah says, It will come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. And he goes on, he says, For though thy people Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, a consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. And then in the next verse it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwelleth in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee, after the manner of Egypt. And yet a very little while... And the indignation shall cease in mine anger in their destruction. There are a number of Old Testament passages which allude to the Great Tribulation in terms of time of indignation. So it's possible. This could have other constructions. It's possible this is alluding to that. When you get to Isaiah 14, that's familiar to most of you diligent students of the Scripture as a passage that speaks of the origin of Satan in Isaiah 14. Starting about verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Now this is uh, uh, piercing the local situation and certainly has in focus a super leader. We assume it's Lucifer himself. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation the sides of the earth. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And this, of course, is the issue of pride. That's one reason God hates pride, because it's through pride that sin entered the creation. But then it goes on and says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Now you can quickly tell this raises a lot of interesting questions of origins and what happened, when did all this sort of thing happen. But then notice what he says in the next verse. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. So again in this very famous passage, very foundational passage in Isaiah 14, we find the term Assyrian used. Now, some commentators jump to the conclusion that it's probably just used there idiomatically because he's uh, uh, used as, uh, as a uh, senet, a, uh, a general for the specific or specific for the general, as a rhetorical device to speak of this evil leader, calling him an Assyrian. 
uh, use it in, in, in other words, using it connotatively rather than denotatively. But that's an assumption on the commentators. Um, now, some people would say that this passage refers to when the Assyrians were attacking the northern kingdom, which indeed they did. They took them captive. But notice the next verse says, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the, the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. So the scope of this is hardly focusing on the northern kingdom issue by Isaiah. The scope of this is far, far, far broader, whatever it's talking about. And there's lots of possibilities. But the term Assyrian there does catch our notice. Let's take a quick look at Isaiah 30. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard and shall show the light, lighting down of his arm with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire with the scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down which smote with a rod. There it is again. Let's take a look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel has some strange stuff. Uh, just take a, few, a couple of sample verses here. It said, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. And the whole passage tends to use trees as idioms for soldiers or leaders. That happens several places. Uh, again, the scripture is consistent. Remember in, in Daniel chapter 4, that's the chapter in the Bible that was written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. It's his testimony. But there it involves a vision of a tree that was cut down, referring to himself. A leader. So that's an idiom that uh, is familiar to your ears if you've studied your Old Testament. But it goes on then a few verses later. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs. If you remember the kingdom parables of Matthew 13, that should echo in your ears. Because the, the, the birds there were the ministers of Satan. And under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all the great nations. And it goes on. Get down a few verses later. The cedars of the garden of God could not hide him. What on earth is he talking about? Garden of God? The fir trees were not like his boughs. The chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Wait a minute. What's he doing in the garden of God in the first place? What's he doing in Eden? I made the nations shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Strange stuff. And let's go take another look at Micah 5 again. This man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land, when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land when, and when he treadeth within our borders. There it is. All this talking about an Assyrian again. See this. And the land of Nimrod again. So again, all this echoes back to the earliest empires. And uh, you remember Nimrod was the first world dictator. He, he built a number of cities, Babel, Bab Tower, El God, a, a tower to God, and uh, Akkad, and Erech, and uh, Nineveh, Sumer, and uh, Kala. And uh, um, it's interesting that we're talking about a guy and a region that was the beginning of all civilization. And uh, his capital was a place called Babylon. Now, what's fascinating about this issue is there is another raging controversy among conservative Bible scholars. And that is, what on earth does the scripture mean when it talks about the future Babylon? And first of all, you need to understand there's some problems having to do with the doom of Babylon as described in the Bible. You see, Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 detail the destruction of Babylon. And among the phrases that occur in those passages, I'm sparing you going through it in detail, uh, because uh, particularly the Jeremiah passages are somewhat lengthy. We could spend spend a full two hours just discussing the subtleties. But the main points of those passages in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 include the fact that it's going to be destroyed in a very sudden, 
catastrophic way. It will, after it destroyed, it will never again be inhabited. Both of them make that emphasis. In fact, not only will it not be inhabited, the building materials that make up the, the city of Babylon will never again be reused. That's kind of strange. Maybe they're ionized. Who knows? They're going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah use that very phrase. Now we all recall Genesis 19 where God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in a very catastrophic, final, deliberate way in the matter of hours. And uh, it's kind of interesting to study Genesis 19 very carefully because the two angels that go there aren't there just to do a lot of favor getting he and his family out. If you read the text carefully, you'll discover that it was a prerequisite condition for the judgment of those cities for them to get out. In fact, the chapter before, Abraham is negotiating with God. What if there's ten righteous and so on? And uh, the principle that clearly comes through that passage of Genesis 18-19 is that the righteous were removed before the judgment. Interesting. But the main problem that occurs here is the destruction of Babylon, as described in the Old Testament, has never happened. Many people, many Bible handbooks and things are confused on this. They assume that when the Persians conquered Babylon, there was a fight. There wasn't a fight. But uh, what Cyrus's general did, he succeeded in, in uh, diverting the water of the river Euphrates that allowed them to slip under the gates and take the town over without a battle. If you go to the London Museum, you can see the cylinder of Cyrus where he brags to the world that he conquered this impregnable capital without a battle by just clever generalship on his, on his officers. And uh, so, in fact, many people that were living there for three days didn't even know it had been taken over. It was just a coup, if you will. And uh, so the point is Babylon was not destroyed by the Persians. It was a secondary capital. Two centuries later, when Alexander conquers the Persians, he makes it his capital. That's where he died. Well, he has base. He actually died nearby. But anyway, the point is that um, you can go, even in the 70, in 75 AD, the, the merchants were still trying to make a go of it. The Seleucid Empire built an, a rival city that was more conveniently located for the caravan routes, and so it, it took the traffic, and, and Babylon just eroded to irrelevance. But as late as the 1800s, when Koldui, the uh, German archaeologist, was excavating, he could hire local people to help him. There were people living there. So when you read the passage in the scripture, it's clear that it has been inhabited. The building materials were used, reused to make temporary shelters and so forth. It has never been destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the big dilemma. And there are scholars that believe that in order for the Bible to be true, Babylon has to rise to prominence in order to be destroyed in a manner that fits the text. And they're a minority. They're a minority. Now, uh, so the, the, don't confuse the destruction of Babylon with the fall of Babylon in 539 B.C., as I've just gone through. Okay. And by the way, it's presently being rebuilt. Now, many Bible scholars laugh at it because what's being done is rather modest. Millions and millions of dollars being spent. Uh, they've rebuilt Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Where the handwriting on the wall was, the archaeologists confirmed the foundations, they rebuilt it. In 1987, Saddam Hussein used it for affairs of state. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, you know, uh, the press regards it as Dis Disneyland East or something, and they make fun of it. But the truth of the matter is, Babylon's being rebuilt. And if you look at the charts, the military charts for Desert Storm, if you have any friends that were in that role, they, you'll see about 62 miles southeast of Baghdad are some, it says, numerous small buildings. No, excuse me, numerous large buildings. But anyway, they're, just, they're not labeled as Babylon. They're just they're, uh, by the village of Hilia. But um, now the question, of course, that arises when people address the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation also describes Babylon in some strange terms. But it also describes it in one hour it's going to be destroyed. It also describes a catastrophic destruction. And uh, now, Mystery Babylon. Revelation 17, 18. In chapter 17 of, of the two, it's described in most, more or less religious terms. There it's described as the great whore. 
and she rides the beast with seven heads and ten horns. Don't confuse Babylon with a beast because Babylon is riding the beast. She is also called the mother of harlots and abominations. She also is described as being drunk with the blood of the saints. And we're indebted to a number of great scholars of the past that have really dug into this. The classic work in this at one time was Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons. He was one of the first. It was for many years probably the primary text until Dave Hunt wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast. And his book is the best documented book on the subject, bar none. He does a thorough job. He, ta he, he links the practices of ancient Babylon with the current practices of the Vatican. And clearly, there is a deep spiritual connection between the Roman Catholic practices, the pagan practices that populate that church, and, and Babylonianism. Now, uh, obviously, that's a book that has, has a high probability of offending someone that's been in the Catholic background. On the one hand, it's also caused many people to discover um, the reality of Jesus Christ, in, uh, 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 despite all the other trappings of that, that uh, administration. Dave is so fixated on that aspect of it that he does not regard literal Babylon on the banks of Euphrates as being relevant in, in future prophecy. And, I, and uh, so that's a place where he and I, are, although we're good friends, have a, a, an agreement to disagree agreeably. <laughs> In fact, at the pre-trib study group, uh, when Dave presented his papers that made up his book, uh, I was asked to be the rebuttal presentation. And everybody expected me, because they knew my mentality in terms of expecting literal Babylon on the radius to be, to be relevant. I'll come back to that in a minute. See, chapter 18 of the book of Revelation describes Babylon the Great. Some scholars feel that there are two different things in view here. That chapter 17 deals with, a, uh, with Mystery of Babylon, the, the uh, religious side of it. And uh, chapter 18 is Babylon the Great, a city. And the people that are upset when the city is destroyed are three groups of people. Kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea. Each one of these groups is singled out almost like a poem um, as, as bemoaning from a great distance that Babylon fell in one hour. Kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea. Now, it would seem that, if nothing else, the Holy Spirit's giving us a clue that the basis of this emergence was world trade. Kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea. But I, I don't see any reason to separate these two. The chapter divisions are man's invention. Now, you'll define that most scholars will fall into one of two camps. They'll either embrace Dave Hunt's excellent presentation, well-documented presentation, on the Vatican aspect of this. Others dismiss that and focus on Babylon as a literal city, and many of them feel it's maybe just idiomatic of New York or something like that. I don't believe that. I think the scripture is very, means what it says and says what it means. But one of the things that uh, I was facing when I had to be the uh, rebuttal presenter to Dave Hunt on the, the great whore aspect, the, the, the woman rides the beast aspect, is I, I said both are true. And that shocked everybody. I believe Dave Hunt is right on the mark with what he's saying in his book, A Woman Rides the Beast. I think it's an essential book for any serious Christian. But I also disagree with Dave. I believe Babylon is destined from the scripture to reemerge as a major centroid on the planet Earth. And uh, this, this aspect of the Assyrian aspect of the Antichrist underscores that to me even more so. But let me show you where I think the answer is. Uh, by the way, the book of Revelation can be portrayed as a book about two women. The first woman is the woman of chapter 12, which you can call Israel if you visualize Israel as starting at Genesis chapter 3. And uh, uh, the, 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 the first woman is in heaven, um, uh, show, portrayed in heaven. She's the mother of a man-child. She's clothed with the sun. Her identity is tied up with the sun, moon, and stars, which is a link to Genesis uh, 38. Her enemy is the dragon. Her relationship, she's hated by the world. She's sustained by the wings of heaven. She has headdresses, a crown of 12 stars. Her status is widowed and divorced. And by the way, those are idioms from the Old Testament about Israel. 
Read the book of Hosea. Her final location is New Jerusalem. In contrast to her, the other woman is the woman of chapter 17, the woman that rides the beast. Where is she? Upon many waters. She's the mother, of not of the man-child, of the harlots. She's not clothed with the sun. She's clothed with purple, scarlet, and gold. Her identity is she reigns over the kings of the earth. Her enemy are the ten kings. She's riding the beast, but ultimately that beast turns and, uh, and consumes her, interestingly enough. She's caressed by the world rather than hated by the world. She's sustained by the dragon as long as he lasts. Her headdress has the mystery Babylon the Great engraved on it. Her st she makes a strange boast. She says, I am no widow. She's putting herself in Revelation in contrast to the woman of chapter 12. Interesting. And her final location, of course, is the habitation of demons. But there's another comparison that I encourage you to do on your own. People often ask me, uh, how can I get through this, this uh, 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 enigma about Babylon? And I suggest very simply read three pairs of chapters. Read Isaiah 13 and 14. Read Jeremiah 50 and 51. And read Revelation 17 and 18. Those are three pairs. Isaiah 13 and 14. Jeremiah 15 and 51. And Revelation 17 and 18. The, what I suggest you do is read those six chapters at one sitting. Take you less than an hour. What you'll discover by reading the passages is the consistent use of phrases among all three authors, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and John. And you'll find many nations attacking. This is not one attack, many nations. This isn't an attack against Babylon by the Persians or something. This is many nations attacking. You'll find that in Isaiah 13 and 14, 15 and 51, and also in Revelation 16, uh, verse 16 of chapter 17. You'll also discover that in the passages, Israel is in the land and forgiven. That means that that eliminates most of history. Couldn't have happened in the past. In Isaiah 13, verse 19, and Jeremiah 50, verse 40, it says it's going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. The same expression is used by both of them. That's also implied by the Revelation page uh, in Revelation 18. In both Isaiah and Jeremiah emphasize Again and again and again, it's never to be inhabited. The bricks will never be reused, especially in Jeremiah. It goes on and on about that. It's also clear that the event we're talking about occurs during what's called the Day of the Lord. That makes it, if you will, an eschatological event near the end times. Isaiah emphasized that. Jeremiah emphasized that. And Revelation, of course, underscores that. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah underscore that we're talking about a literal Chaldean, a pride of the Chaldeans' excellency, a literal Chaldean city on the banks of the Euphrates. This is not a, an idiom or a rhetorical device. It's interesting that Jeremiah and Revelation also emphasize that kings fornicate with her and they're drunk with wine. In fact, even the, uh, both Jeremiah and Revelation uses the expression of scarlet, purple, a golden cup in her hand, and so forth. You'll find that it, when, you, when you read all uh, uh, six of these chapters, you'll have the feeling, you'll, you'll, you'll sense the common articulation despite the difference in authors and the different times that they wrote. Now, how do you reconcile this? How can I say that both things are true? The way I do that is by looking at Zechariah 5. You know, the book of Zechariah is studded with little enigmatic prophecies. Some of them are quite clear and some of them are real riddles. But in Zechariah chapter 5, Zechariah encounters a vision. This isn't a literal thing, it's a vision thing. The woman in the ephah. Let's take a look at what happens in Zechariah 5, starting at verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see... What is this that goeth forth? And by the way, small point perhaps, but if you look through your Bible, when it says, lift up thine eyes, that's almost like a code phrase, that something very important is coming. When you go through the Torah, the Old Testament, Abraham lifted up his eyes. What follows is not just another thing, it's something very significant. It's a way of, of emphasis. And that's what's happening here with this angel that's talking to Zechariah. Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, what is it? 
And he said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. Now, an ephah is a large volumetric measure. It was the standard commercial measure, like we might use the word bushel. It was a, a, a commercial, it was a standard commercial measure in volume. A talent was the standard commercial measure of weight. So one is volume, one is weight in their, in their parlance. He said, what, this is an ephah that goeth forth. And he said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. So this isn't isolated, it's something broader in concept. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So again, you got this big, it visualizes like a huge jar. There is a woman put in the jar, and the lead is going to seal her in there. The lead, the lead lid is going to plug it, plug the hole. The woman has a name. We'll find out who, who she is. He said, this is wickedness. So this woman personifies wickedness. It's my presumption that this woman is somehow equivalent to the mother of harlots of Revelation 18. He said, this is wickedness. And he cast it, it, the woman, into the midst of the ephah and cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So this woman is sealed in this container. She can't get out. Then Zechariah says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Bear in mind, this is a vision. Well, you have to think Jewish. Zechariah is Jewish. The angel is talking to him in his terms. A stork is an unclean bird. It's one of the prohibited creatures. So Zechariah says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. So this thing, the idioms are being used here are unclean. And what they've got contained in this container is wickedness. And they're picking it up between the earth and heaven, they're going to take it somewhere. What's going on? Then I said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? Where are they going with this thing? Notice the last verse. He said to me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, or Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. The term Shinar occurs seven times in the Old Testament. It is the, the plain of Shinar is where Babylon stood. If Babylon's the city, Shinar's the county, so to speak. It's always used as a synonym of sorts of Babylon. So what we have pictured here, apparently, in, 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 in vision, is wickedness is sealed up in this container and is taken back to where it started to build a house in the land of Shinar and should be established and set there upon her own base. That's all. It doesn't explain. That's, that's it. It's an enigma. But when you stand back from the whole picture and you understand Babel from uh, Genesis 11 and Nimrod, the rebel, and you understand that he was the first world dictator, and you also understand that all idolatry, false worship, was codified in Babylon and always has since. It is the fountainhead of all forms of False ideas. Um, even the zodiac that we use in astronomy as a, as a geographical reference. Before chapter 11 had Hebrew names and carried, uh, uh, described the glory of God. In, in chapter 11 on, it's corrupted to the, the way we have it today. You can track, and that's what the scholars have done, guys like Alexander Hislop and others. You'll track every false concept has its origin in Babylon. Now, when Babylon was powerful, those ideas were, of course, permeated through their empire. When they're conquered by the Persians, that priesthood always follows the money. They migrated to the centroid of the Persian empire. When the Persians are conquered by the Greeks, it goes there. When the Greeks are conquered by Rome, where does that priesthood go to? To Rome. If you study pagan Rome before Constantine all that, 
you'll discover that everything they're doing, all the ideas, all the strange stuff they do, are repackaging in Latin what used to be done in Chaldean in Babylon. New names, same gods. And Ashtoreth is Astarte, and you, 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 can, you can track, you can find tables in your commentaries that will give you the Chaldean name, the Greek name, the Latin name, and so forth. Now, same ideas. What I personally conjecture from this, or seeing here, is that this evil system, which of course permeated the Vatican when, when uh, Constantine um, legalized Christianity and is the third successor after him, after um, the apostate and then, uh, anyway, when you get to Theodosius, he made Christianity the state religion of Rome and he outlawed the others. That was the biggest catastrophe of the Christian church because suddenly it became politically correct to be a Christian. Regeneration, this Holy Spirit had nothing to do with it. It was a question of joining the club. And what starts to happen is they start repackaging all their traditions, pagan traditions, into Christian uh, garments. That's where you get the, uh, you, can, you can track most of, I should be careful about the kind of statement, but most of our traditions that are not justified in scripture come from Babylon originally, the Christmas tree. Look at Jeremiah 10 sometime. Um, the wassail bowl, mistletoe, all those ideas are from Babylon. There's, it's, it's astonishing to discover, not just the names of our days of the week and so on, it's amazing how it pervades our whole culture. And I think you can get, you can get carried away with spook shows worrying too much about it, just recognize that's, that's, that we're not of this world, we're of the Lord. But what I personally see the scripture saying is that this whole system is going to return to where it started to get its final judgment. I think that's true of Babylon. I think the power centroid somehow is going to migrate back to where it started. And that's why as I begin to realize that there's a high likelihood that this, the Antichrist as we call him, this world, I don't like that term Antichrist. Um, I, I can't get away from it because it's so common usage. But the term Antichrist is used by John in a different sense twice in his epistles. The spirit of Antichrist. John, who wrote those epistles, was the penman of the book of Revelation, never used it in the book of Revelation. The, word, the spirit of the Antichrist obviously is evil, don't misunderstand me. But I think it's an inappropriate label, really, for this coming world leader that has 46 other labels in the scripture. And uh, that's why I feel free to call him Nimrod II, just to confuse people, see. Um, I think the final world dictator is going to be an echo, in some sense, of the first world dictator. And I think his capital will be Babylon, and it's going to receive judgment. And I say, Chuck, gee, that, where do you get all this? I don't see anything on the horizon. Good! You can't accuse me of trying to shape my theology by reading the daily paper. Because there's no evidence of what I'm saying is correct. But that's, that's what we call the null hypothesis. You see, if you start to see next month, next year, five years, who knows when, some things start to happen to bring Babylon to more world prominence. If you start to see a, a, a global organization start to echo East and West, with the East starting to be primary. Remember, you heard it here first. Huh? <laughs> but more seriously, the fact that it isn't evident in our current publications frees me from any accusation of what they call eisegesis, uh, um, not exegesis trying to read into the text things that are happening. No, it's the other way around. Let's hear what the text says and understand it and then watch. You follow me? That's by suggestion. And so now, so we have the woman called wickedness, sealed a town of lead, carried by two women with wings of a stork, that's important, between earth and heaven, to build it a house in the land of Shinar where it shall be established and set there upon her own base. In other words, where she belonged in the first place. And so... Now, there's a couple of other things. Let's just, before we close, take a look at another verse. Again, verse, Revelation 17, 11 says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. I do believe that that verse fits the structure I showed you in that complicated diagram earlier in the presentation. But it doesn't mean it's limited to that. One of the things that's true of Scripture in fact, one of its fascinating challenges, often the thing is described to have multiple meanings. It's true in one sense, but it's also true in a different sense. And uh, um, 
We think of Jesus as the Nazarene because he was raised in Nazareth. He's also the nuts or the branch. There's a pun involved. The Holy Spirit deals in puns. This verse may have some other significance. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, but he's of the seven. There are people that believe that what may be operative here in myth form is reincarnation. One of the fascinating aspects of that belief, reincarnation, I suppose you heard about the guy that wrote out his will who believed in reincarnation. He left everything to himself, you know. Um, <laughs> reincarnation is clearly non-biblical. Let's, let's not get confused about that. The scripture says, is appointed unto man, but once the judgment. And uh, uh, but once to die and after this the judgment. In other words, the reincarnation is not, in fact, that phrase in the book of Hebrews is there for that reason, to re, as a rebuttal to reincarnation. It's not there to indicate a guy can only die once. Because there are, uh, there is, um, at least, there are several people that died twice. Lazarus died twice. The widow of Nain's son died twice. There are others. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not why it's there. It's there to rebut re, the concept of reincarnation. It's amazing how that idea pervades many, many, almost all pagan belief systems. Do you know why? It's a rebuttal to Satan's lie in the garden. You shall not surely die. Satan hates the resurrection. And his rebuttal of that is to sell this idea of reincarnation. How does he sell it? By demonic episodes. Should you ever encounter a long dead relative that tells you things that only your great-grandfather or your grandfather could know. Don't be impressed, because you know it's non-biblical. How on earth is that pulled off? By a demon spirit. They have memories that go back generations. They're in a position to counterfeit these kind of experiences. You need to cling to the word of God and understand that reincarnation is Satan's lie. Now, the beast that's coming is obviously a demonic personage. So he could pull off the appearance that he's the reincarnation of tilgath pileser or Sargon or one of these Assyrian leaders or whoever, or John F. Kennedy or whatever. He could pull it off. Why? Because they have the information that you don't, nor a few people would have. So that's a possibility that that this is, here's the beast that was and is not, even he's the eighth, but he's of the seven. In other words, somehow he may be posing as literally one of the great previous leaders. How would he do that? By really reincarnating? Of course not, no. But he could simulate it. He could create the impression. So that's a possibility. There's another one that's even more closer to home. Could he be a clone? Is it possible? that this future leader is somehow a clone of some great past leader somehow. The technology has been detailed for you in Jurassic Park. All you need to do to recreate a creature is a piece of DNA and maybe a little bit more. So that's a possibility. There's a huge debate among theologians. Can a clone be saved? That's a, the, the, the theologians are going to chew on that one a long time. You can think of a lot of reasons why they couldn't be, and yet that's also dangerous ground. I wouldn't put anything beyond the reach of God. At the same time, a clone is a man-made thing. There is a, there is a, a the, theology that says there'll be nothing man-made in heaven except scars. It's scars, his, his wrists and his feet. There's another possibility. It's sort of a mix of all of these. And that's is he a Nephilim? Is he somehow the result of mischief by fallen angels? And I would not put any technology out of reach of a fallen angel. We've learned that from the Nephilim of Genesis 6 and the Rephaim all through the Old Testament, the walking dead. Why do I, I, I tend to suspect that a clone can't be saved because a Rephaim cannot rise. The Rephaim in, in, uh, in, uh, in the book of Isaiah points out the Rephaim are not eligible for resurrection. So I need to understand that. So that from all that, I, that doesn't mean I'm right. That's just a tentative conclusion, but we're all learning. One of the things, a lot of people are shocked by my presentation because we've published a lot of materials that echo the traditional view that the Antichrist is out of Western Europe. 
And some people say, gee, it's kind of gutsy for it to come up and say, gee, maybe that's wrong, maybe this is a better view. Listen, the day that we stop learning, we're in trouble. The day that we hold back from you some discovery that we've made that may obsolete some previous things we've said, the day we hide that, we're, not, we're no longer being faithful. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not to the point where I want to oversell this particular viewpoint. And yet I do want to present it to you as a possibility, to, primarily for the purpose of encouraging you to study. I'm going to put a challenge on the screen. And if you accept this challenge, you flunk the course. This is not a time to close ranks with me. This is a time to stand up and challenge what I'm putting on the table. It's a challenge as follows. I believe we are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That is obviously an, a preposterous statement that the Bible says more about the time we're moving into than it does about the whole gospel period. How do you challenge that audacious expression? You have to do two things. First of all, you've got to find out what the Bible says about these days. And the second thing you've got to do is find out what's really going on. Now, a few years ago, that was a tough assignment. The Bible part's easy because you just read and dig in and find out. How do you find out what's really going on? You can't find the 10 o'clock news. We live in a society in which the mainline media takes pride in its ability to foist its own agenda, to shape opinion rather than inform it. And the scandals are manifold. But the good news is there's an end run on the mainline media. It's called the internet. It's called talk radio. It's called over a thousand proprietary newsletters in various professional fields that are uh, self-sponsored, that have their only claim to survival is their uh, integrity. In every field, in every industry, there is news, there are dominant newsletters that let you know what's going on. And in the geopolitical arena, too, in the military arena, they are. You can, you can find these things out. And with the Internet, it's easy. If you know how, you can find out anything on the Internet. You can find out which Russian shipbuilding programs are behind schedule. You can find out the layout of your neighbor's house, if you know how. You can, you can make a list of most uh, crazy things. You can find out anything, if you know how. The Internet is open, exciting. So you can find out what's going on. Now, there are, we monitor 10 strategic trends on our website. And there's no more passwording. It's free. You can just check in. Weapons of mass destruction, the rise of Islam. Each one of these is a category of intelligence gathering in the secular world. It also is biblically relevant. The struggle for Jerusalem, the Magog invasion, the rise of the European superstate, the rise of China, biotech and global pestilence, the rise to ecumenical religion throughout the world, the tide towards global government, and this, the unique challenges to America. Each one of these is a trend that we try to monitor several ways. They're on our, we keep you up to date on our website. But if when you sign on, if you uh, log on our website, there's a place you can sign up for a weekly newsletter that's free. Once a week, by email, you'll get a little one-page summary what happened this week that's biblically relevant and the websites that are following it competently. Free. All we need is your email address. If you get tired of you turn it off whenever you like, but there's no charge. It's just part of our, re our outreach to you. And uh, now, there are paths to our ultimate venture. Most of you are aware, of course, that where our book is now out by Thomas Nelson, Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. But uh, if you want a more comprehensive approach to that, we have an audiovisual presentation on CD-ROM that has f uh, 1,400 computer animated diagrams from Genesis to Revelation. It's gotten endorsements from uh, Tom, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, um, Tommy Ice, Marlon Maddox, uh, uh, Ed Heinsohn. Um, uh, most of the conservative scholars have applauded it. Um, uh, Joe Farah, the founder and uh, CEO of World Net Daily, the primary uh, internet newspaper, has endorsed it. He and his wife use it for their studies. If you have survived that ordeal, then we encourage you to take the Bible verse by verse, book by book. And we have our traditional cassette tapes plus notebooks with all the notes and diagrams. But they're much more affordable now on CD-ROM. The audio is an MP3, so you can download it to your players. It has uh, all the texts and stuff. Uh, and also, uh, most of them are starting to have PowerPoint slides and so forth. 
And we also publish topical briefings. Most of you are aware of the fact that we have uh, probably closer to 100 now uh, briefing packages uh, on various topics, archaeological, scientific, doctrinal, what have you. But we also are getting into videos, and uh, they're also very popular. If for no other reason, you can pass it on to a neighbor as a loaner and so forth. Other resources, we do publish a monthly news journal, and if you uh, uh, give, call us and give us your address, we'll give you a year subscription without charge as our way of getting acquainted, in the hopes, of course, that you find it useful enough to continue. Our internet site is khouse.org. People can't pronounce Koinonia House, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us khouse. Khouse.org is the internet site. We monitor the strategic trends, and they're free. They're no longer passworded. The e-news I've just told you about, the weekly bulletins. We also are host to the Blue Letter Bible, in which you have the, the entire Bible in English, Hebrew, and Greek, all word searchable. Commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedias, all word searchable, and all free. Underline that, free. But our primary interest is to encourage you to get into or start, if you don't, can't find one, a home Bible study. That's where the real growth takes place. That's where the spirit is free to really move. And to help you do some of that on your own or in a group, is uh, we have a thing called K-Rations, a tape a week subscription program. Each, each uh, 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 one hour tape has a 10 minute little update in the front of it, which obvi obviously loses its timeliness as the years go by. People still collect them for their commentary values, but you have a 10 minute update on the current geopolitical, scientific, or archaeological events that are biblically relevant. Then there's at least a, there's about a one hour, verse by verse, expositional study, chapter by chapter, of some book in the Bible. And with it, we also send along study notes, discussion questions, detailed references, diagrams, all that sort of stuff. And we, uh, they traditionally package these things in the heirloom edition leather-bound albums, and actually imitation leather-bound albums. It just didn't fit on this slide. Um, and uh, so you can collect them to match the ones you may already have. And by the way, we also uh, have made arrangements to get university course credit for the commentaries, for those of you that want to accumulate credits towards a, a, a credited degree. So uh, that's, you know, we've talked a lot about pretty dark stuff. And I have a uh, uh, way that I like to close on something like this because we've been talking about Antichrist and demons and all this dark stuff. And we've talked about the coming leader, world leader. And I don't want us to close on that topic. I want us to close on the real coming king. And uh, so I'm in, uh, indulge me this, if you may. You and I are looking for a racial king, king of the Jews. He's a national king. That shocks many people. Yes, he's the king of Israel. It's tragic that uh, most churches fail to understand both of these issues. But he's also king of all the ages, king of heaven, king of glory, king of kings and lord of lords. And the question today is not really about the Antichrist. Who cares? The real question is, do you know our coming king? Do you really know him? He was a prophet before Moses. He was a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon, a beloved, rejected, exalted son like Joseph, and yet he was far more. The heavens declare his glory. The ferment shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau, the A and the Z. He was the first fruits of them that slept. He's the ego I me, the ichyach, asher ichyach, the I am that I am. Yes, he's the voice of the burning bush. He was the captain of the Lord's host. He was the conqueror of Jericho. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. <clears throat> In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, but he's also our avenger of blood. He's our city of refuge. He's our performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of the ages. He's the superlative of everything good. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter. A love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. They say he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him are all things held together. 
Question, what held him to that cross? Let me tell you, it wasn't the nails. You see, at any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. What held him to that cross is his love for you and me. He was born of a woman so that you and I could be born again. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged, he heals the sick, he provides strength to the weak, he regards the aged, he rewards the diligent, he serves the unfortunate, he sympathizes and he saves. His offices are manifold, his reign is righteous, his promises are sure, his goodness is limitless, his light is matchless, his grace is sufficient, his love never changes, his mercy is everlasting, his word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's irresistible, he's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but soon learned they couldn't stop him. The personal representative of the ruler of the world couldn't find fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. He always has been and always will be. He had no predecessor and he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him and he ain't going to resign. His name is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all.